All right, can you guys hear me all right? Excellent, cool. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so as Steve was saying, uh, my name is Nick Altizer. I'm a second year's master's student at the University of Central Florida. And today I'm gonna be showing you some of the research that we're doing um, using drones and open data to understand development and conservation challenges in the Belize Barrier Reef. Uh, so to start, we're just going to cover uh, publicly available satellite imagery. Um, so publicly available satellite imagery uh, include, um, in the developing world, including in Belize, uh, often has a lot of issues uh, with what you're looking at in terms of what's available. Uh, some of these issues can be that the imagery is outdated. So at times, we are actually finding imagery that is nearly 20 years old, um, and on the shorter end, we're finding imagery that can be about three years old, but usually there's a, a solid medium where it can be about seven to 12 years old in Belize. Uh, the imagery that is available is also relatively uh, poor quality. So in some instances, we're lucky enough to find uh, satellite imagery that is at 50 centimeter resolution, but more often than not, we're actually finding imagery that is up to one meter and over that. Another problem with the satellite imagery that uh, is online right now is cloud interference. Now, this isn't uh, as widespread of an issue as the poor quality and the outdatedness of that imagery. But in some situations, like with uh, this island key cocker here, uh, that uh, cloud cover is obstructing a lot of the visibility of what's on the ground. So that causes us to um, not be able to see what sort of developments are happening down there, and we can't paint an, uh, an accurate picture of what that island looks like. Uh, for this island, Key Cocker, this is actually a popular tourist attraction, um, and it's constantly undergoing development. So the fact that we have this outdated, poor resolution and cloud-ridden imagery means that we can't uh, accurately map the vulnerabilities of that island. And then one final thing to mention is that sometimes this imagery is segmented. So when we're looking around, we can find areas and sometimes islands themselves that are split between two or more images, and thus uh, they're split between two or more time periods as well. Um, so drones are actually a very low-cost alternative method for collecting imagery in place of satellite and aerial photography. Uh, companies like DJI and some of the other drone companies are able to provide high-resolution imagery through their drones um, that can be under 10 centimeters for as little as $500. Now, typically, the drones that we fly in Belize are at the upper level of that prosumer limit, so we're, we're paying about $1,700 for, for our drones, but the quality difference and the features that are available aren't drastically different, so if you're looking for a project to use drones in, um, you know, it, it's definitely best to start at the lower end and see what the drone is capable of doing within your project and then moving up from there. Uh, one of the benefits to drones as well is that they are commercially available. You can find them at most retailers. Um, and because of how easy they are to acquire, um, it's actually really easy to fly them. Uh, there's very few limitations in terms of travel restrictions, flying restrictions, and purchasing restrictions. Um, one of the stronger benefits of using a drone in your research is that you have control of that data that you're collecting. All the imagery is um, immediately available, and you can choose to do with it what you want. So if you choose to put it online for free, you can do that. If you choose to sell it, you can do that as well. Um, one of the strongest benefits, actually, to having a drone is that you do not have to wait whatsoever. Uh, you can fly the drone whenever you need to, depending on the weather, of course. Um, but that is an issue that is still prevalent with um, aerial photography and satellite imagery in the sense that if you were chartering a plane for collecting imagery, uh, you wouldn't be able to fly in poor weather conditions just like the drone wouldn't be able to. And then with satellite imagery, again, you would get that cloud cover that's, um, that's there. So again, the strong benefit is you don't need to wait and you don't need to worry about a pilot schedule and you don't need to wait for satellite repositioning. So after looking at these benefits of using drones to replace satellite imagery, um, our project Open Reef, which is an initiative of our parent organization, Citizen Science GIS, um, took flight, as we like to say, because we like to throw out tons of puns when we're doing this research. Uh, the goal of this research was to use drones to map every single island in the Belize Barrier Reef and provide that imagery to the public for free to encourage research and citizen science. Uh, we Furthermore, we opted to use, again, commercially available, low-cost technology because we wanted to show that this type of work can be done at a very minimum budget. Um, furthermore, we also are working to create a replicable model because the research that we're doing, we want to see it be applicable to other areas and similar mapping projects to what we're doing here. 
Um, our process for actually completing these tests is we fly a series of DJI Phantom 4 and Phantom 4 Pro quadcopters. Again, we fly them over every single island in the Belize Barrier Reef to collect imagery. Uh, we typically fly them at about 150 meters and sometimes 200 meters in the air. So far, we've flown uh, 150 islands across 22 field work days. And with each uh, return visit, we're actually finding that our speed, efficiency, and quality is increasing. So over time, we're going to be able to uh, fly more islands in a much, much shorter time period. Uh, the area of these islands that we've flown so far can range from 13 acres, which is relatively small, up to a little over 1,100 acres, which is a very large area to fly, I could say the least. Um, from the estimates that we've gotten from people in Belize, we've been told that there's roughly 400 to 500 islands within the Belize Barrier Reef. So the fact that we've only been, been able to hit 150 over 22 field work days, and the fact that we are increasing that efficiency just goes to show that uh, our methodologies are pretty well grounded and that we're doing a good job um, for collecting this data. Once we have all those um, all that imagery collected, we then sort it and we process it using Esri's drone to map software. Um, the orthomosaic resolution that we've been able to get so far ranges from uh, 3.21 centimeters up to 7.49 centimeters. Our newer imagery is actually on the lower end of that range because of the improved camera capabilities of the DJI uh, Phantom 4 Pro quadcopter. So once we have those orthomosaics, our team then digitizes them. We are looking at stuff like the island boundaries, structures, seawalls, and docks. Um, in some instances, we have roads, and then we also have renewable energy sources that we're finding as well. So once we have all of that data, we put all of it onto ArcGIS Online, both raster and vector base. And again, we are providing that to the public for free to try to just encourage further research. Um, and through that process on our return trips to Belize, we're working with the communities down there, we're working with our local partners, because we want to be able to see how they are utilizing or how they can utilize that information. And then furthermore, we are interested in how local knowledge can help um, impact the, the changes that are occurring and impact uh, the, the quality of that data as well. So from our discussions with uh, communities and our local partners in Belize, we've identified four key initiatives in which our drone imagery would best be used for. Uh, these are looking at developmental changes, mangrove uh, conservation, degradation and restoration, and then also looking at uh, monitoring reef systems. So one of the side steps that we did with this project recently is we worked with the Smithsonian um, down in Southwater Key, since they have a field work station there, and they were very interested in looking at the reef systems. And again, the community identified that as a key impact as well. And then lastly, we also uh, currently are looking at tracking coastal erosion um, as sea level rises and as everything's being moved around. For this presentation, though, we're just going to be focusing on the first two, uh, development and mangroves. So this is an island uh, that's a part of a chain called Spanish Keys in the central region of Belize. Uh, on the left here, we have satellite imagery. I know it looks like nothing, and that is the point. Um, this satellite imagery, the date of capture was in January of 1999, and the resolution is at 15 meters. Uh, from this satellite image, you know, we can't see anything. It's impossible for us to discern any features of the island that's there. It's impossible for us to even recognize that there is an island there. Our drone imagery, on the other, uh, on the other hand, was collected uh, last October, and it's at a resolution of 6.38 centimeters. Now, after looking at this imagery and uh, looking at the data acquired from it, you know, we can see that it is habitated. Uh, people do live on this island, so the fact that there are these quality differences in the imagery means that the population on that island and on the other islands in the Spanish Keys are at risk. So in this instance, we're able to say that uh, drone imagery is beneficial for establishing the baseline data since we are incapable of gathering that information from the satellite imagery. Um, our next example is one of my favorite islands, Conch Island. So the satellite imagery was captured in uh, December 2010, and the resolution is at 50 centimeters. You know, we can kind of make out um, docks here. We can kind of see that there's a structure there. The island boundary itself, though, it's, you know, it's very, very hard to see the extent of that island. It's very hard to see how small it is, how big it is, or if there are any other structures on it. Uh, again, our drone imagery was collected last October, and it's at a resolution of 6.23 centimeters. 
And when we look at the data that we gathered from that, you know, we are, are able to see that there are multiple structures here. There are plenty of people here. And one of the more interesting facts about this island is we got a chance to stop off here and talk to some of the residents. And we learned through local knowledge and, and spatial storytelling that um, all of this pinkish area here, it looks kind of rough. That's all conch shells. So over the course of about 30 years, fishermen in the area, they just started depositing conch shells and they started creating this seawall to build out uh, that island further so that they could start um, putting structures there so that could be their, their home. So spatial storytelling is a very crucial component to understanding the change over time that is occurring with these islands in place of that poor satellite imagery. So again, in this case, uh, we're able to say that the drone imagery is beneficial for building on the potential for baseline data because we can roughly make out some of the features of this island, but we can't fully um, analyze them. Another island that we can look at is Blue Ground Range. So this is, again, part of the Southwater Marine Reserve. The satellite imagery at the top was captured in December 2009 at a resolution of 50 centimeters. Something interesting to note about this area is uh, this area actually suffers quite a bit from the segmentation. So um, we have this image that was in December of 2009. And if you go a little bit to the west, it just cuts straight through a few other islands. And that's where we see uh, imagery from December 2010. So that full year difference means that there are going to be some changes that um, are, are happening between those, those islands, between those time frames, but we can't fully gather that information because we're not seeing that, that change as a whole on the island. From the satellite image, you know, we can see that it is uninhabited, and after looking at the data, uh, we were able to say that it's 96% mangrove cover. Now, our drone imagery was captured in July of this year at a resolution of 4.3 centimeters, and afterward, you know, we can see that there are five structures uh, this island is now inhabited, and the inhabitants of that island are at risk because of the temporal differences between the satellite imagery. So if we were to look at disasters that might be occurring in the area, we can't go off that satellite imagery because we would just be able to say that it was uninhabited and there's nobody there. Um, furthermore, we can see that the mangrove cover has been reduced to 66%, which actually puts the populations further at risk as through our discussions with community members on this island and many others, they all recognize the benefit of mangroves for reducing the intensity of storms and wave action. Um, but now we can see that actual change. So if there were a disaster to occur, we could again gather that information and see how it's changing as well. Um, so in this instance, updated drone imagery is beneficial for uh, monitoring island habitation changes over time. Uh, the last island that we're going to uh, cover in this is part of uh, the Grassy Key Range in Turnif Atoll, which is a high importance uh, protected conservation area. So on this island and many other, uh, there are conservation efforts being done to keep track of, of the atoll itself and make sure that everything is in good condition. Uh, our satellite imagery at the top was collected in August of 2005 at a resolution of 60 centimeters. The island size is approximately 1.29 hectares, and we can see that it's about 63% mangrove cover on that island. The drone imagery, on the other hand, was collected uh, this past March at a resolution of 6.87 centimeters. Uh, we can actually see that the island is increasing in size, so the mangrove cover is pushing further out to the west, uh, increasing that total area of it, and now it's at 89% mangrove cover. So in this instance, the drone imagery uh, is beneficial for mapping those conservation efforts and again, seeing those changes over time. Uh, one of the big things that we do again is we work with the community. Um, we found through our, our local partners in Belize that there is no formal census of the populations out on these islands, which greatly increases the risk of those uh, living out there. Um, I'm originally from Florida, so I've had people ask me, you know, if there's a storm coming, why don't people just leave? Why don't they go to the mainland? Um, and the problem is when you're situated in an area for so long and when you've experienced storms over the years, you know, you become so uh, used to what that situation is that you think you can ride out the storm. And that's not necessarily the case. So in a lot of instances, um, through our discussions with these community members, we were finding that if a storm were to come through, a lot of them would just hunker down and stay on the island. Um, so the fact that we don't have that formal census really creates a problem for those populations that li are living out there and choose to stay out there when a storm comes through. Um, again, supporting or sharing and supporting uh, local knowledge from community members, we wouldn't have um, as much to say about the data that we're collecting without that input from community members. 
we wouldn't be able to understand the environmental impacts, how the land is being used, and how humans are adapting to issues like climate change and sea level rise out there. Um, furthermore, through this collaborative effort, when we're reaching out to communities, uh, we're basically just trying to bridge the gap between science and community. Uh, we're always very self-conscious of our positionality when we go down there. We don't want to be the researchers that parachute into uh, this foreign environment and try to tell people how to collect data and what to do. We're very interested on their input because their stories um, and their knowledge is very important to, um, to amplifying the effect of this data. And through that, we do run a lot of educational programs when we're in Belize. We fly mini drones to teach kids the importance and the power of drones. And we were mostly looking to try to uh, foster these positive education outcomes when it comes to uh, disaster management, conservation, and general land use on those islands. So the use of that local knowledge in storytelling in the place of satellite imagery has been really, really useful for us to, again, see those changes over time and know those actual changes over time because when we have a satellite image that's seven years old and we have uh, more modern drone imagery, we can see how it might have changed. We can see that it was a block of dirt and now it's a big island based on conch shells. But with that local knowledge, we're actually able to understand how it transitioned to that point. So in conclusion, um, we just have been working on a very well-grounded, replicable methodology for replacing satellite imagery with drone imagery. Uh, through our discussions with community members and uh, many other researchers in the US, uh, we've found that by adapting and molding this methodology, it can be applied to other areas or similar mapping projects. Um, we're also finding that drones are cost-effective, they're easy to use, and they're able to be used uh, when the imagery is needed. So again, fly whenever you want, as long as the weather uh, conditions allow, allow you to. And because of that, it's free of the issues that satellite imagery might be riddled with in the developing world, which is, again, the outdatedness, the poor resolution, the cloud cover, and the segmented um, areas and islands that we're finding. So from this, we're able to recognize that you know, the, the islands in the Belize Barrier Reef are changing. These populations, or the individuals that live out there, they're at risk because of these changes, and it's very important that we protect them by utilizing this drone technology and drone imagery and making it publicly available so that it can be used to further uh, the betterment of these communities. And again, providing that, that imagery encourages that community participation and education and uh, really gets people interested in participating in the research that we're doing because it's not necessarily the research that we're doing um, and it's just us, it's what we're all doing. You know, it's about the community and everybody coming together to try to utilize this information as best as possible. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, our partners and contributors, um, both in country and abroad. Um, we've um, been grateful enough to receive funding from the NSF to run this type of work. And then we've been um, also grateful enough to receive funding from the Smithsonian as they've allowed us to stay out on their uh, research island free of cost to conduct some of this research. Uh, lastly, I just want to say, if you're interested in finding out more about our, our work, um, you can look us up on any of the social media platforms or reach out to my professor, Dr. Timothy Hawthorne. Um, share and like everything that we have on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and as one final note, uh, we are starting to initiate a new um, aspect of this project called the Amazing Drone Race, where we are looking to get universities in the US to come down and participate in this type of research so that we can show them how to fly these islands using drone technology and providing that information to the public for free. Um, so far, we have four universities on board. So if you or anybody that you know is interested in joining us next summer to learn about a little bit more about this work and contribute towards it, then definitely reach out to us. Thank you. <laughs>